Welcome to an awesome edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. We're going to focus on cannabis with Sean Stiefel, who started Navy Capital, worked at Millennium, Barclays, one of the smartest men I have come across in the cannabis industry. I've been following pretty much every post that Sean has put up for three or four years now. Sean was even kind enough to take one of Rebellion's interns a few years ago. Sean's the man, he's smart, his hedge fund also does venture capital, so his vantage point on the industry is met by few. Sean, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So my first question is on CBD. It's something that has really kind of happened everywhere. You see the signs all over New York City, CBD sold here. What is your stance on it currently? I think that it was pitched as somewhat of a panacea for a lot of different things. And over the last couple of years, we've come to learn that it really isn't that beneficial, certainly in the type of concentrations that are in an average retail product, for, for instance. Um, there is a medical benefit. Clearly, that's why GW Pharma is what it is, and Epidolix is used to treat seizures. But at the end of the day, as a consumer product in drinks, topicals, whatever it might be, uh, we don't really buy the thesis that it, it's beneficial. I see. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Let's jump to cannabis. Are you more excited about the Canadian market where it's legal or the budding U.S. market? Yeah, I mean, I think just using numbers, the Canadian market, which is a total population of about 40 million, is roughly the size of California, and we've got 50 states. So we're, we're a lot more excited about the opportunities that in the U.S., especially post-election with New Jersey coming online and what that means for bringing population into legal markets. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the sports betting numbers that came out this summer when New Jersey opened sports betting, but... It was astounding, absolutely astounding, the volume that came through. I, I couldn't believe it. I'm I'm good... I, I know uh, the propensity for vices, that's for sure. What Do you have any ideas on the numbers for the rollout of New Jersey? Can you give us any type of background there? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I always point people to one of the most staggering statistics that's been released this year. So in Florida, which is a medical market, True Leave reports the average True Leave patient spends $3,800 per year. I mean, just for context, if you think the average Floridian makes less than $50,000 a year, that's an enormous amount of money on a per capita basis. Yep. Then you, you, if you extrapolate New Jersey and REC, uh, it's not going to be 3,800 because you're not going to have the, the kind of the flow through that a medical market does. But let's just say you have 5% penetration and a thousand bucks kind of a person. I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar market, no question. Yeah, no, definitely indeed. Are there public players that you're excited about? Or do you think there are any public players that are positioned for this? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest player in New Jersey currently is Cureleaf. Uh, Cureleaf is sort of the behemoth in cannabis. They have the biggest footprint in the country. Uh, they dominate the state of New Jersey. Their New Jersey operation is one of the best of any company in any state. Uh, we, we anticipate they're going to continue to thrive there. GTI, Green Thumb Industries as well. They have a phenomenal location in New Jersey. And we anticipate that given their capital position, they're going to be really able to invest quickly. Uh, one of the dynamics that happens in these markets that transition from medical to rec, like what happened in Illinois, is it doesn't make a ton of sense in a medical market to go and spend 30 or $50 million building cultivation capacity because there's just not that many patients. However, because nobody's actually put the capital into the ground, the minute you switch to flip and you bring on a few hundred thousand or a million more patients, there's no supply. So Sean can sit here and grow his weed and sell it for $4,000 a pound because there is no supply in the marketplace. So mm -hmm. it behooves anyone that has the capital and a license in New Jersey to expand as quickly as humanly possible because we are going to be undersupplied by a factor of 10 if this were to go sort of wreck tomorrow. Uh, I don't anticipate wreck until kind of end of 21 at the earliest, but that's the dynamic. What about Governor Cuomo's recent comments regarding New York possibly follow, following suit? Do you have any color there, Sean? Yeah, I mean, look, we're looking at sort of huge economic distress across the country. And if you're talking about great, New Jersey's going to get a ton of tax revenue, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, create tens of thousands of jobs because of this industry. How can you as a fiduciary or a responsible governor sit there and say, I'm going to let it all go to New Jersey? 
So we've always felt that in this election, obviously a Biden win would have been nice, but the biggest thing on the ballot was New Jersey, because New Jersey is going to drive New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, uh, and you're talking about huge swaths and, and economic centers of this country. Cuomo will respond. I think a lot of the reason New York hasn't moved forward in the past has been sort of bickering over where the tax revenue allocation is going to go. But given what's happened in the wake of coronavirus, you need that money in so many places, that bickering is dying down. No, no, very well said. In fact, that corresponds with everything I've been reading in uh, local New York news, that you know the tax revenue situation in New York is absolutely dire. Everyone knows about the people leaving the state. And you know when people get desperate, like Cuomo is with his current budget, there's a good chance that you know, New York recreational usage could come much sooner than anyone expects. And that's what I've heard from a few friends who work in, for state. Who knows if that's true and what will happen. But I think that one of the you know, effects we'll see from Corona is a proliferation of state's approval of cannabis usage for the tax revenue it's, it's really something, as you mentioned, as a fiduciary, it's hard to ignore. And with Cuomo's 8 to $10 billion budget gap, whatever it is, I can't remember off the top of my head, it's going to be one that he needs to fill through whatever means possible. So would you recommend, I mean, if, if someone was unemployed right now and had some decent savings, would you recommend they move up to upstate New York, buy some land and start a grow house? Or is that a little premature? Or So, I mean, the way, the value of these licenses, so New York has currently around 10 licenses for cultivators. Um, the value of those licenses, if the state were to go wreck, would be in excess of sort of $100 million. Yep. So it's very, yep. very hard for the average kind of person to jump in. Um, the way people have gotten lucky in the past is they've moved early in early rounds in states that are so far from wreck that it's a less competitive process, doesn't cost as much to kind of put your application forward, and then people get lucky over time if that state goes from medical to wreck or whatnot. Sean, let me interrupt you. Have those 10 licenses been sold already or they're being held by the state to eventually be sold? They're already issued. So I should caveat that by saying that's what's already been issued. If New York were to go wreck tomorrow, that same dynamic I described in New Jersey would be even more pronounced in the state of New York. I yep. think New York needs about 10 million square feet of cultivation capacity in order to supply the market. I don't even think we're at anywhere near 500,000 in the state. So wow. you're talking about a massive amount of cultivation that needs to come online, and it's probably going to be a lot more than 10 players that are going to fill that void. Now, may I, so I may ask a very naive question, Sean. Absolutely. Can any of the tobacco farms be converted quickly or to become you know, ready growers? Is that a long process? Yeah, so it, it really depends on the state. In, Boston, in Massachusetts, for instance, the state grants licenses that are square footage caps, meaning that you, you can't just convert an outdoor farm. You have to actually have some, somewhat of a greenhouse structure or an indoor structure. The quality obviously different, is massively different between outdoor, greenhouse, and indoor. And so you're gonna to wanna to have all those different kinds of cultivation because high-end flowers traditionally grow indoor. It's a lot prettier, a lot tastier, a lot more valuable. Um, that doesn't matter as much day one, but all of these things cost a lot of money. I mean, just for perspective, a typical big greenhouse, or sorry, a typical big indoor build in a state like New York is gonna cost $50 million. Now the ROI on that is massive because you can sell it all right away, but it's a huge capital injection. And until the kind of capital markets really, really open up, there's only a handful of guys that have that type of capital at their disposal. So if, we're on, if one were a massive real estate company with excess capital to spare, would you recommend that they build a grow house uh, in upstate New York in the near future? If you know, I, I think you know, the biggest thing is the license, you know, without the license, all of it is for not. Gotcha. So gotcha. You yeah, no, it's a very important point you bring up with these licenses. Uh, no, really uh, uh, very, very, it's been a great conversation so far, Sean, you are a wealth of information. So I, I want to get, uh, you know, back to the public players. Uh, there was a company called uh, Insys, NC Pharma, uh, Pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And they had a massive blow up. Was that more fiduciary irresponsibility or was that more fraud? Can you I give mean, that, that, was, that was the whole fentanyl. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of things that happened there. Got to watch my words that were, were sort of unsavory. 
and that's why that company blew up. But that that really had nothing to do with cannabis. That was a fentanyl specific issue. So you'd agree that you know dealing with the management is one of the most important parts of when Navy makes an investment, being able to trust that management to execute on their vision. Yeah, I mean, what, what we have really pivoted towards over the last year is, is really running a blue chip portfolio. I think it is so early in the industry and the valuations still are so attractive that you're not really getting rewarded for going downstream and, and going towards someone that's more of a question mark. I mean, to me, it's pretty clear the bigger getting bigger and running away from the pack. And those are the best led companies. The bigger getting bigger and running away from the pack. Very well said, Sean, and very informative for our viewers. You know, so many of our viewers are traders. I, I hate to ask this, it's not something you normally do, but are there particular stocks you would recommend for our viewers to look at? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think, again, back to what I just said, the biggest players are distancing themselves. And so when I say the biggest players, you're looking at a true leave who dominates the state of Florida is now getting into other markets. You look at a GTI who's got a dominant position in Illinois and very, very kind of powerful. But I guess, are there any tobacco players, I guess is what I'm asking, that you would yeah, include? At the moment, the answer is no. I mean, I believe it, it's in their interest to wait until sort of things are a little bit more mature and business models are a little more mm -hmm. proven. Uh, I think they, they've kind of, a, a couple of them, alcohol and tobacco, moved too quickly in Canada and probably regretting it. Yes. No, my uh, my friend Howard Lorber runs the, I don't know if you know, Vector Group. Uh, they have Ligget Tobacco. And, you know, they did not have a, a great experience with their electronic cigarettes. And they're kind of just, you know, they kind of put e-cigarettes and cannabis and CBD all in that same kind of, we're not sure we're in a wait and see category. And so you would recommend that Howard would wait and see for a little bit longer to, before he makes a move? Yeah. I mean, look, the issue right now is that it still remains federally illegal. Obviously today's a big day with the, the house voting on the Moore act, but it still needs to get through the Senate, which is the big blockade. Indeed. Um, so we, we're still talking about something that's federally illegal. Obviously tobacco companies, are heavily, heavily re regulated by the federal government. And so it, it's sort of jumping into something that they, they may not want to yet until things are a little further along. This has been just an absolute A-plus conversation, Sean. I couldn't be more thankful. Before we conclude, do you have any parting uh, thoughts for our viewers or anything you want to talk about in regards to Navy Capital? Your yeah. very, very, very successful hedge fund. I hear only great things about it, by the way. Con congratulations on that. Yeah, look, we're super excited about the future. I think it's been, I've been investing in the space for five years and I can say that this is the best risk reward that I've seen. And that's in the context of a fund that's, that's had some very strong returns. Mm -hmm. um, my view is that you're seeing who's got the best management teams now, you're seeing who's got business models that work, who's thinking strategically about what market stands are, and you're still not talking about valuations that are remotely excessive. And so the day that these guys can trade on NYSE and NASDAQ and you get Robinhood traders kind of driving them to the moon, we can have a different conversation. But for now, you're talking about some of the most exciting companies in the world with some of the most exciting growth trading at multiples that are kind of like industrial companies. So we're super excited about what we're seeing. And I think 2021 is going to be a great year. Fantastic. Well, Sean, you stay safe during these crazy times and endless thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me.